Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. Tonight is a very important Bible study. It's about the two natures, the old nature and the new nature. Very important for Christians that want to get the victory. These scripture verses can give you the victory in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall, also in the likeness of, uh, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians, and thank you for the opportunity to have a victory over sin, that we might take it with the blessing of our salvation and the knowledge of your ways through your spirit, through the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now this passage begins a whole section which goes all the way to chapter 7, revealing how to have victory over sin. If a Christian lived by Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7, applying the materials of those chapters to his life continually, well, he would have a constant victory over sin. It is possible. For in, the, in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. The problem is how to continually apply it to have the victory based on these two facts. We are identified with the Lord's death, and someday we shall physically be raised like him. The Apostle Paul gives three clear steps in the process for gaining victory over sin. First, you need to know, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Know that your old man is dead, and desire the flesh to sin can be destroyed, or resisting through the power of the blood. You need to know, God has reckoned your old man, your Adamic nature, to be dead. That's why... He sees no sin in you because he sees Jesus Christ in you. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We have a phrase called plead the blood. If a Christian would daily get on his knees uh, and plead the blood on his sins, that he commits and asks to be washed and cleansed, there's a lot of miraculous things that can take place. Uh, evil thoughts, plead the blood, ask God to wash your mind. Uh, wicked desires, plead the blood, ask God to cleanse that from your flesh. We're not talking about your destiny now, we're talking about a day-by-day -day practical application in walking in faith with the Lord. Before you were saved, you had no choice but to sin. Your soul was attached to your body because your old man was in charge without a rival. When I repented of my sins and trust Christ as my Lord and Savior, my nature changed. My old nature remained as it was, but when Christ came in after a spiritual circumcision, and it's the same for any born-again Christian, you now have a new nature that through the Holy Ghost, uh, the Word of God, it challenges that old Adamic nature of the flesh. Reckon the flesh to be dead, walk in the Spirit. However, you no longer need to serve sin anymore because you are free to walk in the Spirit and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the liberty. That's God's liberty is that you are free from the body of death to walk in the spirit at liberty. 
Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon yourself dead to sin, as dead men cannot sin, and alive unto the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at the cemeteries and you go by them, they have many dead bodies in there. Those bodies sin, and wherefore by one man sin under the de- uh, uh, wherefore by one man sin under the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for it all have sinned. But you know what? There isn't a single person in those graveyards that's sinning anymore. Dead men cannot sin. If you reckon your body to be dead and you become alive unto Jesus Christ and walk in the spirit following him, you will have a victory over sin. And the right question, the true question, is not what would Jesus do? Because you and I are not God. We couldn't do what Jesus could do. The right question is, what would Jesus, my Lord and Savior, have me to do? And you have the answer in the scriptures. The scriptures will reveal to you God's will and how he would have you behave and act and conduct yourself. And if you walk in the spirit, reckoning your flesh to be dead. Paul put it this way, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Apostle Paul is a tremendous example of what an individual can do that is living a crucified life. He's a tremendous example. We get discouraged. Uh, we get tired. Uh, we get uh, forlorn. We feel forsaken. We get Uh, We get all kinds of fleshly anxieties and problems and infirmities from our flesh because we listen to it and we cater to it. And you just need to reckon it dead. And when you reckon your flesh dead, then all you have left is to go to the scriptures and the word of God and to walk in the spirit and you'll get a victory. Now you see, the issue is to will. Paul willed to walk in the Spirit. Paul submitted himself to the Spirit. Paul reckoned himself crucified. And what a victory he had. That man, more than any other man in the human capacity, shook the world with the gospel. And the scriptures that we have today that guide us as Christians, God gave to Paul through inspiration. Yield yourselves to the Lord as instruments of righteousness. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, to help you understand this more, I have to use myself. It's no different than any other Christian. Up until the age of 24, I had a weak conscience that would hold me back from some sins. But to the most part, whatever my flesh wanted or sought for, I sought for it, and I sought to placate it and give it whatever it desired. And that's what my life was about. That's what America today is about, consumption, consumers, consuming for the flesh in all manner of things. And when you reckon yourself dead to sin, then you can have a victory over it by walking in the spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian is to treat the old nature as dead And you are to treat the new man as alive and in charge. A Christian has two natures living within him. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give exchange for his soul. There's nothing that you have that you can exchange 
or your soul with God. The flesh is concerned with satisfying its senses of touch, sight, sound, smell, and taste. The truth of the flesh is it cannot be satisfied. It just wants more and more and more. You cannot fix the flesh. The only way to control the flesh is to nail it to the cross and leave it there. And every man that striveth for the masteries is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as I'm certainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul's fear was to be a castaway. His fear was not to die and go to hell. His fear was not to be used to the Lord. When a Christian does not walk in the spirit and repeatedly sedates his flesh and follows his flesh, after a period of time, the Lord will find that he cannot use a Christian. And he'll cast them away. Not to destruction, not to death, not to damnation, but to uselessness. Paul was afraid to become a useless, unusable Christian. When you nail the flesh to the cross spiritually, you deny its sinful desires. When the flesh starts crying like a baby, and boy will it cry like a baby, and self-pity begins to rise up, count your many blessings and see what God's done. When you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. I die daily. He died daily to the flesh. The problem of life is counting the flesh and its deeds as dead, as the flesh is always crawling down of the cross and out of the grave to sin again and again. Before you were saved, the sin a sinner has is mostly unbelief. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Someone might show her the TV. But did you know that after you are saved, that unbelief is still your biggest problem? If a Christian could just believe Romans 6, verse 9 through 11, they could lead a sinless life. It's just believing what God said, reckon your old nature dead, submit yourself to the Lord, walk in the Spirit. But how to will? The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, it's learning to love the Lord Jesus Christ, wanting to please him, and wanting to be rewarded with his fellowship and with his spiritual blessings, and falling in love with the Lord, wanting to please him, walking in the Spirit, after you reckon your flesh to be dead, will give you a victory over sin. If a Christian honestly believed their flesh to be dead, they would not indulge it and coddle it the way they do. You would only care for its necessities, and they would take care of themselves. And having food and raiment, let us there would be content. That's almost impossible for a consuming consumption American today. But they that we rich fall in temptation and snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. But do you realize this? If you, if you counted your flesh dead, uh, dead and that was your standard and having food and raiment, you'd be content. Do you realize there wouldn't be anybody in America that would be in despair? I mean, you have to want to go hungry in America to end up hungry. There are so many programs and so many ways to get your meals and your food. America is an abundant land. And 
And having food and raiment, let us there would be content. But they will be rich, fall in temptation and snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Seeking what your flesh desires, keeping up with the Joneses, richer and richer, wasting of time, wasting of energy. You have families to love, children to raise. You have a God to serve. There's so much that God would have for you to fill your life. And if your standard was being content with food and raiment, if you work an average good job in America, you handle your money uh, correctly, you uh, tie to the Lord, you can be uh, more abundant without additional effort, most Christians can, than food and raiment. I've worked all my life, and the Lord's blessed me with many things beyond food and raiment. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, money is not the issue. It's the love of money. You train yourself and you develop a good skill as a Christian. You uh, get the education necessary as a tool to earn a living. There are many skills and trades and professions and businesses and um, things in which you can earn a good living in a 40-hour work week and have time for your family and time for God and minister and serve the Lord. It's having a dead flesh, a crucified life, and walking in the Spirit. The living faith of the Christian is to believe in the two natures, counting his flesh to be dead, and the body of flesh is dying and will one day end up in a literal grave. You might as well count it dead, because it's going to be dead. Unless the Lord takes you home, in the translation, your body's going to the grave. It's going to end up dead. While the inward man is renewed day by day through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, study your Bible daily, plead the blood, pray, walk in the Spirit. By yielding yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. See here. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You know what kills most Christians? The pride of life. The devil comes and speaks to you and says, well, you don't have this, and you don't have that, and uh, you need to impress this one, and uh, you're not impressing that one, and on and on and on. If your flesh was dead, the devil couldn't be speaking to it. Reckon your flesh to be dead. Your members are the parts of your body. Your hands, feet, fingers, toes, eyes, ears, lips, mouth, which are in a battle and a tug of war with your two natures for control of your body with the nature of the flesh pulling you towards sin and your new nature pulling you towards righteousness. I guarantee you, if it's something pulling you away from anything but God's righteousness, God's holiness, God's love, God's way, God's truth, it ain't of God. And boy, all the things that so many Christians, as soon as somebody gets saved, the first thing a person does if he really gets saved as all the parasites come descending. And, well, now that you trusted Christ as your Savior, do you have this? Do you have that? Oh, you need this. You've got to get this. You, you, you surely don't believe. If they'd only have their flesh dead, get into the Word of God and live to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you don't know that when you first get saved. And the devil's there. The devil's there to trip you up. And the flesh, the flesh will get you. Your members are the parts of your body. 
Ephesians 4.21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. You need to change your language. When I first got saved, Christian language was strange to me. What is this? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Where did all this stuff come from? We never talk like that. You have a new conversation. God is good. Life is better than I deserve. Boy, that's a good testimony to a lost world. Boy, does that open up opportunities to give a track, give a disc, give a DVD, give a witness and a testimony. Uh, I say that all the time to lost people. It shocks them. They never heard anything like that. How are you doing today? They're looking for wonderful, or they're looking for ooh. They're looking for a natural response from the natural man. And you say, I'm better off than I deserve. And it's like, whoa, I've never heard that one before. Well, you see, I was on my way to hell for my sins, and Jesus saved me. And now I'm alive to God, and I'm going to heaven, and I have assurance, and I can live life. I'm free from the ravages of sin if I walk in the Spirit, if I submit myself to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't have to, I don't have to go through the miseries that people are going through. And you don't. I was saved 24 years ago. 24 years ago, excuse me. I was saved at the age of 24. That's a lot longer than 24 years ago. And the life I lived before I got saved despises the life I'm living now, but the life I'm living now with the wisdom and knowledge and experience says, you poor fool, if you'd only gotten saved when you were a little kid, you'd have been so much better off to have missed all that. I feel sorry for all the addicted people in the world. Addictions destroy, they bring your life down to nothing. That's what the flesh will do. It'll bring you into bondage. And that's the liberty. That's the freedom. The freedom from the bondage of the flesh. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Remember the battles between the two natures within you, the old man and the new man. See how Paul writes it? For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. That's because the flesh is always battling for control. If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that is good. Now then it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Why? Because when the Lord looks at you, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't see you anymore. He looks at your cleansed soul that's been purified and washed in the blood and and through the circ circ uh, circumcision made with our hands, it's been cut away from your flesh, and he sees Christ in you, the hope of glory. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. One of the things that discourages Christians, don't let it discourage you. Just learn to crucify your flesh. Is that even though you're saved, your flesh is always trying to crave something that it shouldn't. Something that's not good for you. Something that's not going to bless you. Something that the Lord is going to be displeased with. The flesh is always, and Christians get discouraged. Well, you know, oh, this body of flesh, uh, that's normal. Crucify it, reckon it dead. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The law demands righteousness without giving you any power to produce it. God's grace, this is important, gives you the righteousness demanded of the law at salvation and the power to live righteously after salvation. God's grace has the power in it. The law, as a school teacher, will bring you to Christ. The law tells you what is wrong. But the law has no power. It's God's grace. Paul had an infirmity of the flesh, and he besought the Lord 
to relieve him of it. And God said, my grace is sufficient. Plead the blood. Walk in the spirit. My grace will get you through. Now you get this today. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. God is not interested in you and I sinning. He's interested in you and I following him in the spirit through love. The Christian has no excuse for living an ungodly life. But if he does, that does not mean he will lose his soul's redemption. What it means is he has lost his love for his Savior and his Redeemer, which is the power and proper motive for living godly. This is where the victory is, loving your Savior, putting him first. Here's what Jesus said. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Why do you do right when you do right? Do you do it because you want the world to applaud you? No, it should be because you love the Lord and you want to please him. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. When the Christian does wrong, it hurts him because he's not showing the love and respect due to his Savior and his Lord after all the Lord has done for him. What most people don't do and if you want to have some real power in your life, is sit down and meditate on God's love for you, God's sacrifice for you, God's suffering for you, God's interest in you, God's caring for you, and what God will do for you, that he will never forsake you, that once he saved you, he will not cast you away as far as the lake of fire and eternal damnation and yield yourself to him. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. All you have to do is ask your Savior what he would have you to do. You have the scriptures, you have the knowledge, you have the revelation, you have his spirit, you have his love. If you'll serve him out of love, again, don't ask what Jesus would do. You're not God. Ask what Jesus would have you to do. You're one of his disciples. You're one of the souls he's redeemed. You're one of the people he loves. It's all about your Savior. Truth is self-evident, and it will be self-evident at judgment seat of Jesus Christ, where our love or our lack of love towards the Savior will be judged by our Savior. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Don't worry about the failures of other Christians. Don't let their stumbling discourage you. That's their problem, not yours. You are not under an obligation of worldly success. You are under an obligation of eternal love with a desire for your faithfulness. What the Lord wants from you is faithfulness. Many men will proclaim their own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. If you read the book of Revelation, the Bible speaks of Anticipus, my faithful martyr. Do you know other than the book of Revelation, nobody knows who he is, where he lived, his family, his lineage. Nobody knows a single thing about him, but you know who knows about him? God does. Because God, through his spirit, when he gave the revelation to John, the beloved, John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, wrote down the words of God, and God remembered a faithful Christian. Ah, he didn't turn the world upside down. He didn't have the biggest Sunday school. He didn't have anything going for him that we know of other than faithfulness. 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 
Oh, there's a lot of Christians that boast and brag, and there's a lot of Christians that you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and, and it comes to naught by the end of a lifetime. But those that are faithful are going to be doing something, maybe a little bit, every day for the Lord. A track here, a witness there, a testimony there, a resistance of the devil, a crucifying of the flesh, here a victory, there a victory, the more in the spirit, the more following, the more walking, the more victorious. For to this end, both uh, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. It's going to be awful, awful humiliating embarrassing to be before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and your Savior is going to judge you for your love towards him and you're going to see the wounds in his hands and the side and the thorns with the holes and the penetration the back and the feet and you're going to see a, an individual being that was willing to be crucified to save your soul was willing to descend into hell to pay the penalty for your sins, had the power with his own right hand to bring his own resurrection and come up, which no individual could. And you didn't love him after what he did for you. You're going to be naked and embarrassed. And you know what? With all that ungratefulness, you're going to look at him and you're going to say, and he won't cast me into hell. He won't forsake me. He paid the penalty for all my sins, past, present, and future, and for my infidelity and my lack of love, my unfaithfulness. And all the times after you were saved when you played the harlot with the devil and the flesh. And he still loves you. But there ain't going to be any rewards for you because it wouldn't be just. You'll just have his love and you'll have his redemption. And you'll have your humiliation and you'll have your regrets for eternity that you didn't love your Savior who loved you and pursued you to the death. So in the next verse, Paul gives thanks to God because before you were saved, you were a slave to sin. You had no choice. you got a choice now. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Then someone gave you the gospel. Your heart saw the love of God, which you uh, stopped despising, and you responded to it because you didn't want to go to hell. You didn't want to. You didn't want to pay the just penalty of your sins. See here, or despisest thou the riches of His goodness? You know God is good, and God is harmless, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness and grace of God takes us away from the wrath of God and places us under the love of God in Jesus Christ. There's no fear in love. You don't have to be afraid of anything in this world. But perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. He loved us first. Salvation is more than intellectual, mental consent to the facts of the gospel. But they are required. It's so much like a marriage. At one time, for the first time in my life, I saw my wife. And my eyes delighted in her. And then I got to know her. And then I decided that I wanted to be her husband and marry her. And she consented to me. And all this is intellectual, but what made us marry? The heart. The heart. It took vows, for better or for worse, in sickness and, uh, and death, uh, in sickness and health, till death we do part. Forty-two years later, we're still married. But a spouse could abandon you and leave you alone. But Jesus Christ said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When you become the Lord's, he will not let you down. We 
love him because he first loved us. Salvation is more than an intellectual mental consent to the facts of the gospel. Intellectually, you must know he is qualified to be your savior, your redeemer. But spiritually, you must place your faith in his ability to be your redeemer. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know, if you go over on my computer, I have a picture there of my wife. Now, my wife and I were a lot older than when we got married. And the world has abused our flesh. But I have a picture there of our wedding day, and I have her in her bridal thing, and I'm looking at her, and to me, she is beautiful. And you know what? Somebody else said, I don't think your wife's that pretty, but I think she was really pretty. And I'm not ashamed. You know, people say, your Savior isn't all you think he is. No, sir. He's altogether lovely. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's my Redeemer, my Lord, my Savior. He's all sufficient. He loved me, and I love him because he loved me first. He taught me how to love godly, not lust. This world says love, it means lust. Love means sacrifice. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. I go on visitation and door knocking. My flesh doesn't like to do that. I go because I want to please my Savior. As a saved, born-again Christian, hope can only be in what the Lord has done for him and nothing else. What are you trusting in? Where is your faith residing? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There's only one name. There's only one that went to Calvary's cross. There is no other name given under heaven. When a soul repents of his sin and places his faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, they are made free from sin forever. Take advantage of it. Submit yourself to the Lord, walk in the Spirit. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. The doctrine of truth in the new man is a practical day-by-day -day acting out the doctrine of truth in the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what Paul said. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Two natures in the Christian. One nature to a lost man. Two natures to a Christian. And these are contrary to one to the other. They are at war. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under law. Now you know what I'd like to do? And we stop, we stop and think of vainglory, but we don't do it because we don't have the love that we need and the walk in the Spirit. I would love to turn the world upside down for the Lord. But there's an awful price to pay to do that. A night and a day in the deep beaten with rods, cane, shipwreck, and famine, and hunger, and thirst, and peril. Paul loved the Lord, I'm sad to say, more than I do. Paul was more faithful than I am. Paul was a better man than me, a far, far better man. But the more we walk in the Spirit, the better we can be I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For if ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Before redemption, the soul is free from righteousness in the bondage of sin as a slave to the lust of the flesh. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Now ye are not your own, but you've been bought with a price. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hey, maybe you can't turn the world upside down because you just don't have 
the kind of love that Paul did. But you could witness for the Lord. You could give out a gospel tract. You could resist sin. You could stop watching pornography and dirty movies. You could stop lying. You could stop cheating. Uh, you could stop eating on your taxes. You could do a lot of things that God would be pleased with. You could glorify God. You could sing in your heart. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. You could sing it vocally. You could sing it to the people you're working with. You could let them hear the melody of the joy of the Lord in your soul. You could do a lot. There's an awful lot you could do. Don't worry about what Paul did. Don't ask what Jesus would do. Ask what Jesus would have you to do. Here's what God would have you to do. Glorify God in your body. How are you doing today? Much better than I deserve. My Savior took care of my sin problem. What a glorious and wonderful life. It doesn't matter how bad things get in this life. I'm going to a better place. I'm going to a city where the roses always bloom. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, for you, for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. We'll conclude. What fruit had ye then in those things wherever you are now ashamed? Everything of this world, you leave it at the grave. When you go there, it's just like Job said, naked you come in and naked you're going home. The only things that will last are those which are done for Christ. A Christian is a fool if he doesn't build for the future and eternity with God. But now being made free from sin and become the servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a gift. Oh, how wonderful. Glorify God in your body. You can't have victory over sin Reckon your body dead. Submit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Read your Bible. Plead the blood. Walk in the Spirit. And glorify God. You know the best way to get sin away from you? Well, let's say you're a woman and some guy comes and starts hitting up on you. You know what you want to do? Give him a track and say, are you saved? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the precious blood. He ain't going to stay around. Your flesh says, tempts you. You're going you're gonna to not be a Christian gentleman. Give her a track. Tell her about Jesus. God will protect you. When she flees from you, you'll be better off. You wouldn't want to live with a bond. But if she repents and gets saved, God may give you a good life. See, put God first. Do things for God. God will protect you. His ways will bless you. Friend, come to Calvary. Come and fellowship with us. Come and learn of a glorious Savior and freedom from sin and victory over sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God loves you. We'll be your friend. And we'll tell you all the truths about Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we praise you.